Recording, okay. Power cube micro track gasifier working session. Updates on the micro track power cube. So as we develop the micro micro track and power cube, we're first of all talking about the gasifier being a very practical um, pancake small form factor design that we can use to make it practical on the micro track slash power cube. So I'm going through the power cube scalability presentation. Take a look at that. Um, but basically, the power cube is a basic structural and power component for building GVCS machines. Here's in this presentation, we'll go through how the power cube can be used with other modules, uh, the modular wheel units and tracks to build various construction and utility machines. So I actually want to run this run these concepts by, by you guys so that we're on the same page. So power cube being the the build, base building block now that the actually actually the infographic is the old one on page two of the presentation, but the new version is is structural, which means right. that we can use that as a building block. It's not not just something you have to build around. It is the building block. Okay. So we can do a derivative, a micro track, an immediate application of the power cube. To do that, um, there's a there's a simplified path we can think about doing that. So we take the structural power cube. We can link on um, warehouse to access the file. You can play around with the power cube. Um, conceptually, we can approach it as we develop the power cube, which we already have. We then develop the tracks independently and then com combine the tracks with a power cube. That's a basic process. So now let's look at the details of how to do that. Um, so I'll, I'll explain this a little bit. Um, the way we think about this will help us scale this to other machines like larger, larger things up to bulldozers. But basically, um, there's also, I'm actually going to return to page four. Um, and on that page, we already have two things going for us. So we have the the modular wheel units, which are ready modules that can be used. We have the power cube. Okay, so that's great. So how do we go into into developing the tracks? So we have the universal rotor. Um, Tom, can you pull it off the? No, can we? Can we find it off anywhere? I don't know. Yeah, except it's down, so we might not have a picture of the universal rotor. If you Google it, OSC universal rotor, you'll probably find a, an image somewhere. Okay. Um, so here's the deal. If we look at the modular, the extreme manufacturing modular design, there's a concept of interface design and wrappers, and we actually can use this to to the full advantage here. So modular design interfaces is um, when you do this design, you have to think about how the, inter the pieces fit together in a simple way, and conceptually we can do that. And here, we can actually apply the concept of a wrapper, meaning like an interface to an interface, so that a special piece that's used between two modules to make them fit together. And so I, I would call for, if you look at the universal rotor mounted on a universal mounting frame, which is just a, a welded, welded structural frame, upon which you can mount the the rotors. So say you have the rotors on this, you mount them up, take those rotors, and now you have to add the tracks. So so the, the trick is going to be how do, how do you develop the, the tracks? Um, I won't get into the details of how you mount the rotors on a mounting frame here because without a picture it's kind of hard to explain. But the the point after after the tra the universal wheel module, the modular wheel unit, instead of putting a wheel like we've used before for building tractors, we can put on a pretty much a cog wheel or a drive wheel for tracks. So now that means we have to develop tracks. So that's the big part, develop tracks. Um, that's, the, that's the deal. And then if you have this base with the modular wheel units and tracks, we have to, I think we really have to think of the power cube as something that um, without worrying about the details of how the tracks, track unit and the cube fit together, we have to make that interface super simple. So that means you can handle the tracks like a platform, 
that is pretty much completely independent of the, the power cube to simplify the design and make it adaptable to all kinds of devices, not just the micro track. So that's, that's the basic idea. And I have to, um, just, just to put in perspective, like the way we drew the tracks right now, they're kind of like, if you go back to picture in slide number three, if you look at the tracks, how they are right now, cause I've been thinking about is trying to think about how this machine will scale to, to other machines. And the way we have it right now does not really address it because the the tracks are not exactly independent from the uh, structure, the structural power cube. What I mean by that is, first of all, the way the, the power cube sits on it, it's a little complicated. There's a few tubes going up to the power cube, joining the other elements together. It's a little complicated. And the second second main element I want to point out is that the tracks are actually like at the level of the power cube, not below them. And that's going to matter in a scalability issue. But so so what I'm saying like while the the final micro track is going to look quite a bit like this, it's going to be slightly modified. And and I still think the the picture here represents quite well what we're going to do. What I would what I would call for is wheel units that are um, and wheel units the the track units that are actually much simpler um, than what we have here. So I'm going to start a page number six just to draw that out. And how does that relate to the power cube discussion? Because as we move forward on a power cube, we want to make sure that we can stack them together side by side, and then the tracks actually work. Um, with that same design. So let's, I just want to show you guys like in the next 10 minutes how the tracks could look. Uh, so new slide. Uh, so track, track concept. And I think this is actually a, a major breakthrough because this will allow us to scale the tracks for any kind of uh, a size of a machine. Um, all right, you guys still there? Yeah, right. Okay. So let's take a, let's take the, I'm going to draw tubing. So like the tubing we have, the four by four tubing, I'm going to put two of those together uh, at four inches apart. So this is 12 inches high. Now we're going to take a shorter stub, which is going to just join them. Uh, so basically this little stub and it's going to join them together. That's going to be what I was talking about, this wrapper. I'm calling this a wrapper using the software term of a wrapper, of an interface between two modules. So, okay, so now we have the modular wheel units, and this is looking from the top. So this is top view. So now I'm going to demonstrate and just draw the uh, wheel units to scale. Uh, like so, so the wheel units, the modular wheel units. So that's the that, those are those plates. So let me see if you can recognize it. But basically, the wheel units look like this. It's got a shaft going through the whole thing. It's got the, the structure structure of the way you attach it to the other frame, and there's the motor right there. Okay, so that's the modular wheel unit. Bam. Okay, so we're going to attach it very simply with two bolts, and I'm going to represent that with with circles. Uh, so there's a little, there's a bolt there that goes through the frame. So remember that this, I'm going to expand the size here. So you remember that we're using structural tubing that's got um, the holes in it. So there's one enlarged hole there. There's another one here, and and bolts go through that. And that's how you basically slip the slip the motor on, and it's there. Bam! All right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna group that, and then rotate it 180 degrees, and we're gonna put a, a motor right next in an adjacent hole. So the so so this way. The basis to which you're attaching is only 12, in, 12 inches. So can one of you draw a dimension arrow that says 12 inches on the vertical? 
bam we've got that now these might actually have to be a little spaced apart by one or two holes um, because what we're gonna do is add the cog belt cog wheel for the um, the drive of the tracks so this is gonna be like from above that's gonna be the cog wheel upon which um, basically be like a large sprocket um, for for driving the track and it's going to be like you know spanning across the shaft okay there you go and on the other side we're going to have this other sprocket same thing same kind of deal sprocket okay so so now we're going to drive these tracks this is a view from above okay 12 inches is the vertical height of these the, see the tubing member I just colored in green that's 12 inches high um, the rotors are 8 inches wide and they're next to each other okay drive cogs so now I'm gonna draw more so basically I'm gonna take the middle I'm gonna take this part here so the rotor without a motor but with a shaft on both sides so basically take out the motor and instead of using a motor use like extend the shaft so we can actually use that same structure to put a shaft going out both sides okay and what's that gonna be so it's still using the pretty much the same universal wheel motor structure without the motor and that's going to be our idler so we use one of these structures here and another one of those structures here that's going to be our idlers um, and then the tr so that means they're non-driven so I'm going to color these as red hot for driven that's where actually the power comes from these are just idlers uh, the blue are gonna be idlers which means they're not driven they're just idling but what's their purpose their purpose is to provide so I'm gonna draw tracks let's put all the track material in like purple color so now the tracks are really gonna be so it's gonna be an idler here basically the same as the driver wheel but it's gonna be it's idling and it's going to be this one here and this one here so now um, what's the width of this uh, someone else draw the width the vertical width right now is 36 inches so what what I've just shown now is that the width of this drive set for the micro track could reduce the width of the micro track remember we were having troubles with like 46 inches or something this is back to 36 inches uh, because the shaft sticks out about 12 inches and then there's the drive cogs so I'm gonna draw the track now in three points or like four points so that's gonna be the let's see this track is gonna be transparent so I'm drawing this transparent track is gonna span span all of this right so that's our actual track it's these it's stuck on the idlers from one side and notice that the motor is underneath it in other words the motor the motor actually for comparison is actually a little smaller in real life um, kind of like that but the point is that the motor like the tracks actually span the motor but that's fine because you got idlers right on the well to make it more actually to make it more realistic like um, should actually put these together a little more because they all they need to do is be like right next to each other so it's not too long they can be pretty much right next to each other like that but that's basically the drive system so that means that this whole thing here 
I mean, these are way too long now, so we can just shrink them up. I mean, basically, so that we have enough to fit, you know, fit the... So the track is going to be pretty much like this. One track and a second track. Does that make sense? Comments, suggestions, that's it. So we have this frame and onto this we can put our, our power cube. Um, and the power cube is going to basically like be on top of the, like as big as this uh, floor, floor um, basically this footprint here. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Comments, suggestions? Yeah, uh, how, how wide is it from uh, track to track? 36 inches between outer edges. Yeah. So. So here's the deal. Uh, who's doing that? Uh, CV. Uh, so I see what I'm counting is 36 inches. Right, I thought the 36 was that. Where? No, that's that's 12 inches high. 12 inches like up and down. So 30. What I'm seeing for the height, this width here, is about 36 inches, where I'm drawing the arrow who drew this. Where, where do you get those dimension arrows? Uh, it's a line. It's the line arrow, and you can select the thing that has a line. If you click on a select line, it al allows you to do a, an arrow. Yeah. Do you see the line, line thing? Okay, so this dimension here, what I'm seeing is 36 inches. So this is a major breakthrough in terms of how this can be done using our existing parts. And I think this is absolutely legit. Not only this, we're using the existing um, universal rotor units without the motor, turning them into idlers. Okay. And it... Hey, someone stole my arrow there. Um, put that back. So... So now we end up with a structure that's about 36 inches high, uh, I mean, footprint, which is great. That's, that gets us as tight as we need. Now, what's the length of these tracks? It's also going to be, um, just for reference, these idlers should be about 15 inches uh, tall. Which means that each drive wheel, if you go through the numbers, it's 15,000 inch pounds for each one of those universal, the, for the hydraulic motor. 15,000 inch pounds means that a 15 inch diameter wheel, a drive cog or wheel, drive sprocket, you have 2,000 pounds of pushing force. In other words, this device, what we drew here conceptually, is guaranteed 4,000 pounds of, of traction well, um, of ro ro rotational force. That means if the tracks grab the ground perfectly, you would have up to 4,000 pounds of pushing force. You're not going to have that because the machine itself is not going to weigh 4,000 pounds or more. Uh, the micro track is only going to be like between one and 2,000 pounds of weight. So, but anyway, we have more traction than we will ever need in this setup right here. Um, so that's that's the general concept, but the trick here is that the I don't see any problem why that the tracks cannot simply span around the hydraulic motor, which is what exactly what we did on page three for the micro track. Uh, you see the the drive motor is pretty much under the tracks, but if we put it all on one level, we don't need to make the tracks. What I'm saying is we don't need to make the tracks that high. And we can probably get away with three uh, cogs on each side, three track cogs on each side. Uh, okay, so let, that's top view. I want to I want to draw that out in. Uh, I'm gonna set up a new page, new slide, and show the side view because the side view. Um, so track side view. It's gonna be. Let me see. Let 
Okay, so a side view is gonna be like this. Um, basically, you got. Let's see. So on a side view. I guess we get rid of all of this. Um, so that's going to be the, the drive motor. It's gonna look something like this. So those are the well no, um it's gonna be actually those so those yeah, okay, good job. Um so the actually no, that's I mean uh, it's going to be right there. The, these are the pe that's that's how the universal rotors look from. Uh, so that's the back of the motor right there. That's the I'm going to label that back of motor. Um. Yeah, good, good. So the idler is going to be. This thing has to extend down. Yeah, good job. Um, so the idler is going to be there. Yep, that's it. So, okay, they're going to have to be a little further. Make sure they fit together. Um, they're going to be a little wider than that because you got to fit, basically make them fit. Um, but yeah, so that's going to be... Let's see. Let me see if I can draw... The tracks. So the tracks are basically going to be this. Should be a little more round, but yeah, that's what the tracks are going to look like. So there you go. Uh, that's the side view. Oh, how'd you do that? It has a little. There's like a little arm stop that allows you to control the. Oh, okay. The oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. Uh huh. Very nice. So that's that's how it looks, uh, pretty much. So that's the back of motor. The other side is driven from the other side. And this thing, the tracks just pretty much span around the motor. Now we're gonna have to have enough space between the wheels to, between the drive cogs to allow for the fittings on that motor. Um, in pr uh, yeah. No. Uh, in practice, that motor size is gonna be actually a little smaller than that. Um, it's about, it's less than eight inches in diameter. Yeah. So it's, yeah, but that's how it's going to look for the side. And so these tracks are actually above like where the, uh, these are hanging onto it. Yeah. It's going to look like that. The tubing is above the tracks. So maybe. Yeah, some it looks something like that. Yeah, that's roughly speaking what what we're talking about. Um, now this actually this square here that's gonna go only in so far as it captures. Yeah, something to that effect. Um, but now, so what's this mean? Um, if you look at it from the side view like that, the good news is that I'm going to cut in a power cube. You can now put on power cubes as needed onto the top of that. So I'm going to shrink this one down. So if you've got this platform, so basically what we did, I'm going to label this part. That's um, So because we use this platform, this platform can be 
modular. It could be very flexible. Modular platform. Uh, we call it a wrapper in that it's kind of like an interface. It's it's going to be welded because otherwise it would be get really complicated. Um, so make this neat little interface between the basically the the drive system or the motors, and then you can just simply slap these power cubes on top. Um, so for the micro track, you've got one power cube. And that's that's about how you know to keep it to scale. One power cube there would look like probably like that somewhere. Something around that size. Um, so conceptually speaking, that's that's what it would look like. And basically, two bolts, like the bottom beams of the power cube, would attach to the to the platform. Now, what this means is that we can put two power cubes on a side, like next to each other. Like if we want to. Um, yeah, I mean, this whole platform would allow you to, I mean, you can extend that platform to, well, okay, let's do like the scaled version of this. So I'm going to take this and duplicate this slide to show what it would look like if you want to build a bulldozer. And would this be scalable? So I'm on page eight. So if we take, there's different ways to go, but say we take, um, so a power cube here, I would say to do a bulldozer, we can take one of these, you, don't, you can probably cut out this, all these, um, cut these out here but you can put like well I won't I won't even go there yet let's let's return that if we want to start scaling this I think we can go like this first of all you can mount multiple power cubes on top of this so you can do it like two back to back and if you want to, uh, since the universal rotor is uses, we have one that we've built with three inch shafts. I think what you can do here um, is actually double these up if you want to, like if you had to. We can design the drive hubs because it's on three inch shafts. I think you can accept uh, another, actually another track pretty much on there. Um, so we can copy a bunch of these, basically add a bunch of these over. Yeah, kind of get the picture there. But basically we can bolt them like, you know how they have dually wheels, we can probably do this. And we can design it to, to, to do this so that when we build the track, you're actually doubling the track, but the track itself would have like the, the cleats on it would be say like four by, by 10 inches. Uh, so that way, if you double the tracks, you've got like 20 inches, which is, that's a wide track. That's a pretty wide track, but, but I think it would be practical in an instance like this, you put two power cubes, you, you know, uh, you can actually double the tracks. And I think we can design it to to go nuts like that. Now, so you can take this. Uh, you, you can certainly do something like this. You have the platform just extends a little longer. Or if we copy this, new slide, or uh, slide, duplicate slide. What would be the limit if we put, like, um, these tracks even wider apart? 
and then put four power cubes on on the same platform. I don't see why you can't. You can you can bond the, the power cubes together, and you can just bolt them together, and that gives you some structure there. And and then I can lay on a platform such that basically the tracks would be like right there, you know. Now this gets you to an eight foot wide machine right now. If the if the power cubes are thirty six inches, so it gets you six feet on the power cubes, and then you can go. The tracks, by design as they are here, they can actually be hidden under. That's the beauty. So basically we have a lot of flexibility here. And now these tracks, you can put on more idlers, you can actually extend them to, to go further back. Um, I mean, you can like double up the tracks or whatever. You, this is absolutely modular as it is. So here you can have a 100 horsepower machine that weighs about... Um, each power cube weighs probably like 800, so 800 times 4 is 32, so it's like 800 times 4 pounds plus the each modular wheel unit is about 250 pounds, uh, which is uh, times how many of them we've got. If we don't go nuts on, the, okay, we, if we don't extend the tracks, if we keep them like super short, uh, there's going to be, the way we drew the, the the graphic in slide 6, we have four modular wheel units. So basically you've got four times, four times 250, so that's another 1,000 pounds for the modular wheel units. Now that's without the tracks, and then you, you count the weight of the tracks and all that. But here we've got like, um, four times eight is 3,200. This is equals 4,200 plus plus tracks uh, plus the uh, plus the wrapper whatever that frame that we use uh, but that's basically like you've got a 5,000 pound machine right here well probably more like 6,000 or 7,000 with everything included the tracks can get heavy depending how we do them um, but I don't see why this we can't make it scalable like if the tracks are underneath the this the power cubes and that's that's the reason why I insist on that those tracks being under the modular platform, because then whatever you put on top can be totally flexible. So this doesn't account for things like the driver cab, which would probably be you know we can probably put a cab. I don't know where we put the cab, but in a configuration like like this, we might want to put the cab like the operator is like right there in the cab can put the cab basically a fully enclosed cage for rollover protection w where you see everything very clearly if we had to do hmm that, that be the front or the back? yeah that'll be the front if you wanted to do a loader I could see how you can mount the loader arm somewhere to here around this and you can start lifting a lot of weight yeah yeah, mount on a, on a structure. You can mount it with one mounting point being the power cube, perhaps. Uh, the other mounting point being somewhere around the cab. But the cool thing is that you can totally start looking at it as cubic structures that stack one on top of each other. So here we have a 100 horsepower bulldozer. Now there's nothing that says you can't do this and put an articulated joint between the two. Uh, and you have the track so basically so that's this was step two new slide would be uh, or rather duplicate slide uh, I don't see why you can't do um, something that's more like with the articulated joints that we've already shown so step three would be basically double this up with an articulated joint that's 200 horsepower we can try that I, I would like to go 160 so maybe four in the front and two in the back uh, but basically they're like this is a monster machine now like uh, but it's highly scalable what you okay now there's tricks that we're missing here and the missing link is we do not have ground hugging pivot built in it you guys understand that do you know no. what that is about? Okay, so basically, 
because the two sections are like now it's getting to be a big structure um, when you go over uneven terrain you can easily have one of the wheels come off the ground so what you need to do like this thing would actually be a pivot uh, okay yeah we did but we didn't do that we did um, let me explain it so the pivot would be such that that there's a rotation on this axis so this is a rotation axis we did not do that we did that in life track one we did the axis of rotation but in life track five and six what we did was this there was a pivot underneath the back section of the tractor which we can't do right now if we use the modularity because that needs more parts so if we put the rotation axis here we can do it now the way this is uh, we've never done this well we have done it for lighter duty for this kind of heavy duty we haven't we don't have experience with that kind of a beefed up rotation axis but what would have to be is something like a disc um, this disc here basically rotation disc um, it's gonna have to be super heavy duty um, rotation disc right there now we also have to we have to also remember that it's a rotation disc slash uh, articulation articulated turning turning side to side so basically here this this actually um, this not only rotates uh, it also turns side to side like on life track five and six so that pivot would have to have be a built-in kind of like rotation plus side to side yeah does that make sense so that's it um, but using basically like Tom what do you think what do you think of this I, I mean it sounds good but uh, the one thing that would concern me is if you have that, that one axis that couples the two in the forward and rear section and, and uh, it, let's say you get where, where you really are pushing against something really hard. Let's yep. say you try to knock down a tree or something. Yep. And, and all the forest is going to be on the front. Yep. Well, if, if, you're, if your front and your rear are not aligned very precisely, you know, they, say if your rear is still, if you're turning a circle before you hit the tree, yeah. then, then uh, the rear could be pushing very hard against the front section. Agreed. Cause trouble because of the rotation axis. Yeah. So like a bulldozer, if you like in a bulldozer operation, you typically go straight forward. Upon turning, you'll basically bend the machine instead of yeah. That that's that's true. Therefore, if you're if you're doing any anything that requires all forward motion, the two two sections have to be aligned, by all means. Otherwise, you will uh, potentially break stuff. Basically, put a lot of force on the rotation axis there instead of transferring it to the front. Um, whatever you have on the front. So the operator would just have to be aware of that. Which is what I have to do right now with articulated turning. I cannot push against something when I'm articulating. You you basically the back wheel is making the tractor turn instead of pushing forward. That's an issue with a current articulated design, right? So there's uh, that you have to consider as the driver. Now the good thing is. Typically in bulldozing duty, when you need all the traction, you typically go in a straight line. So, or if you're like knocking down trees, you're going in a straight line. Uh, for us, if we're doing, uh, this would be relevant to, to broad scale making of berms where the turn radii could be a hundred feet, so it's a very slight turning or whatever. Uh, pretty much going straight. Um, but there's a reason for this rotation axis. And that is, this allows you to, um, using the very simple universal, the modular wheel unit right now, which has just plain pillow block bearings, which are not designed for much axial load. They're not designed. You can push the shaft in and out with about a thousand pounds of force. That's not like that's not heavy duty 
you can push the shaft in, in and out through the bearings. However, with the if you were relying on turning like a bobcat. Uh, but here, the turning happens by articulation, not by putting a lot of force on the actual wheel unit. That's the the way, like the reason for the articulation axis, the or the articulated side to side turning, is that you release the pressure on the wheel units significantly. Because if you think about a bobcat when it turns, a bobcat can spin in place. Um, you can do that. Now that right. puts a lot of stress on the wheels. Here, okay, like your, your slide just before this one to build a bulldozer, you, you, don't, you don't have any articulation. You only have two sets of tracks, so you'd have to do basically skid steering, right? Here you do as long as the width is comparable to or larger than the wheel than uh, than the track length then turning is relatively easy, doesn't put a lot of stress. But once you get the track length to be longer than the distance between the tracks, you start putting a lot of stress on the tracks. See what I'm saying? Basically a very wide machine where the width, it's the ratio of the width of the machine to the, to the, be, to the footprint of the machine. See what I'm saying? In other words, if the tracks are sh like, are like in, in slide eight, you can put more power cubes and you can, you can still do this. If you look at slide eight and you can still be able to turn, you see that? Right. That still allows you to turn. Um, but once you were to lengthen the actual track base to very large, no. Uh, you put a lot of stress on those wheels. Now, actually, there's a little detail in the sense that if the drive wheels are towards the center of the track, the center of the track is the place where the least axial thrust happens, as opposed to the front and back of the back of the track. So, so this is actually very favorable in that we get away. Like this is like minimum design. In other words, with off-shelf bearings, which cost fifty dollars for like the three inch bearings, which is dirt cheap. I mean, three inch, that's monstrous size. With $50 bearings, you're able to build a multiple deca ton machine, uh, like 10,000, like 10 ton, uh, 30,000 pound machines. You're able to pull off with those types of bearings, which nobody does because nobody designs machines to be like this in this uh, they put a lot of money into the this industry standard is to put a lot of money into the proper bearings proper tapered bearings which require huge forces if you're talking about things like you know cat d5 bulldozers so here we get away by with with the force requirements by articulated steering primarily and keeping the track width, like the width between the tracks, higher compared to the length of the tracks. So we're able to do a lot with very simple parts. So now we don't know this yet, we haven't done it, but the it looks great on paper. Go ahead. Now, will, will, will the articulation be controlled by the tracks or will there be some hydraulic cylinders there to push from side to side? two hydraulic cylinders here so let's draw those in yeah we use life track six has one hydraulic cylinder it has one like that um, here we want to use two yeah so there'll be hydraulic cylinders so basically this rotor this is going to be a new module we have to make this rotation disc articulated turning side to side now here's the good part if we make that disc, that disc can be relevant to, to 360 degree backhoes. You know what I'm saying? So the side to side backhoe is limited to about 180 degrees. The ones that spin all the way around, the excavators, they use a disc mechanism of some sort where they can rotate, they can continue rotating 360 degrees. 
So this same kind of a rotation axis can be used for 360 degree backhoes, which is good. So that will be another module to look forward to uh, when we get that rolling out for backhoes. Um, yeah. Uh, but that's the general idea now. So the relevant point of discussion for the power cube right now is when we put up to four power cubes together, we have to consider are the outlets and the exhaust and the connection tubes going to be in the way of any of this. So that's just a consideration. And I think if we have the, so currently, let's see, if you look at the power cube, uh, I'm going to, um, I went to the 3D warehouse. If you rotate it, so I'm looking on my screen here, but if you guys go to that, it's linked. We have the exhaust going to one side. We have the interconnection of the hydraulics right here going to another side. So let, let's see, let's hear the cats freaking out here. Um, if you guys look at the spin, the thing around so let's let's actually add some nomenclature to that so let's make the front the front of the engine where the control panel is I guess so if that's the front right that's where you make all your connections you've got the throttle there you've got the filler filler you have to consider the filler for the both gas and for hydraulics connections of the of the hoses the connections of the hoses go up so basically, that's all good, like fillers, connections of hoses, they all go up, that's pretty good. Now the only thing that goes side to side, if we're stacking cubes side to side, I guess we primarily have to concern ourselves with um, where the exhaust goes and where the interconnection tubes go. Does that, does that sound right, Tom? Yeah, that sounds about right. Tom. What else? What else do we have to worry about when we consider interconnection? Do we care about anything else? Because you don't want like the smoke blowing into another power cube, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, you could you could take all the, the exhaust and, and channel them together, you know, and and, uh, and vent them all out through one tube. Say one tube per cluster of four. I mean, that's well, basically an eight-cylinder engine you got there so I mean they do that kind of thing all the time yeah but we don't have to because think about this uh, if you go yeah that's one way to do it I think it's actually simpler so okay so let's say the back so on the back side is the muffler and the hydraulic connections okay let's let's actually go back to the document and do a diagram of that so insert um, so I'm gonna put um, I guess slide 11 is there. Okay, so so four power cubes connected. Okay, so let's draw that out. Well, I guess a simple model would do here because we care about the exhaust and the and the hydraulic interconnect. So if the H is right there, hydraulics interconnect are there. So they're pretty much like right there. And then the exhaust is like right there to the side. Yeah. So if this is like that was someone calling us. Um, yeah. I just texted them to to use the link in an email okay so if you're looking from the top I guess if you're looking from the top 
if the exhaust is that way, hydraulics is that way. Um, so we group that. Whoops. Hydraulics are there. Okay, so if we just put them like this, if you just mirror, um, so the other power cube could be, if we tilt it like 180 degrees, or just rotate it 180 degrees, it's good there. That one could go there. Um, but we're missing those other two. Well, we can stack them like this. That's, f I mean, like this, that would work. We're kind of missing the mirror images though, right? <laughs> Looks like this would work here. We're kind of missing the mirror image. Um, can we can we make the exhaust po point the other way? And the other ones? Wait, can you mount the... Well, you can get uh, exhaust uh, uh, the mufflers that point the other direction. Huh. But yeah, you can do that. Then, then you wouldn't have a standard power cube though. Hmm. Right. So we are getting into just a little bit of an issue here regarding the exhaust, if it's going... No, not really, is it? Let's see, if, if, if these are... No, we, we are kind of getting into a mirroring issue, right? Because... What do you think? Uh, you could have... You can have the, because the exhaust, you can have them pointing out to the sides, right? Yeah, yeah, you could do that. Yeah, so right now, I have the exhaust is it's pointing down. It goes out the muffler and it basically goes at a forty-five degree, degree angle, pointing downward. Pointing downward? Yeah. Well, down and out, kind of towards the side. Yeah. Um, I think if you had the exhaust blown out to the sides of the the, the micro track, it wouldn't be a problem. Right. So if you have. Um, yeah, I mean, so it's going out that side, and this one here, like this. I mean, this is it, right? This would do it. And then the question is, can the hydraulics interconnect? Well, you can... So how do we connect the hydraulics, the interconnects? You could go... Um, let's see, let's draw a line for how they would go, a curve. So this one's yeah, going... It's just a matter of running some, some hose, right? Yeah, but it would have to go like this, for example, here, right? That's one. Because it's pointing out back. And this would be the other one. And then you'd have to have another one going from here. Like that, yeah? That works. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wait, if there... I mean, I don't think you need this, do you? You could just go from... You can just... So now, are you talking about the uh, return plumbing? Uh, this is the, the suction. Right. This is suction so that you make sure you're connected at the bottom at the suction so the level of the four tanks is equal all the time. Yeah? Yeah, you can connect them, not a problem. I mean, it's here it's sufficient. You know, you go from this one, you can go back to this one right there. Right? I was kind of thinking about just running one, uh, two, you know, well, actually, down, down the middle of the power cubes, and then have little uh, kind of kind of like a manifold, and then have um, you know spurs coming off of it to go to each connection. Right, it would just be a 
a hose with uh, like four nipples on it that that's what you connect to the power cable. Right. Right. Uh, like as a, so a four a hose. Oh yeah. Just a separate piece. Yeah, just have, just have one oh, yeah. tube. It would go in a straight line, the the from from top to bottom, in, in between these two power cubes, or have it run within the chassis or something. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and just just have uh, T's in it, you know, wherever it needs to tee off and go to the individual power cubes. I think that's good. Yeah, yeah. This this looks like it's not a problem. The exhaust is not an issue. Um, and what I think for the actual control panel. So if we've got a, you know, th what I foresee happening is because you've got so much coupling of all this, all these uh, plumbing. What you probably want to do is send every one of the. Okay, so for like as far as the actual hydraulic outlet, it's from the. Uh, let me draw just a simple thing line. So you gotta con connect the control panel to all the hoses, to all the power cubes. So what I see happening is. You know, wherever this uh, hydraulics is coming in, this would be like uh, so. This power cube feeds in here. Like you got to go in like ah, whatever. You got to have like what I see happening is this control panel would basically like on one side, you would put all the inlets into it from each power cube. So you got four of them coming in. We gotta look at the detail. I mean, details of the control panel. But I think it's gonna be quite nice if you put like all the inlets go into this, and you're gonna have a bunch of bunch of outlets. Well, the the concept is that we're combining. I mean, basically, like with 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 four power units like this, where each one has two hoses in and out, it's gonna be a real crow's nest. So we're gonna have to just pay attention to routing the hoses nicely. That's gonna be our control panel. But anyway. You do end up with an interesting opportunity there. I mean, you could take two of the power cubes and use them for powering the tracks, and then use two for yeah. the other uh, Yeah. Um, the way it would be. Yeah. Yeah. We have to. Yeah, we could do that. I think the idea is we have to yeah yeah it, it's uh that's one way to do it I think that's there's many options to go uh, we can connect like if you think about there's four if we do the double structure well the front and back articulated and there's four motors then you it's, it's probably a good idea to have a motor like a dedicated motor for each or um, I don't know. I don't know. There's, there's a, the the control strategy can implement itself in many, many ways. So we we'll have to think about a careful, careful deal. But I mean, offhand here, everything looks pretty good as far as uh, it's gonna work. Like the stackability is there. I don't see any issues happening. So that'll be the bottom line. Uh, so I think, the, I mean, the bottom line for the power cube as is, I think we should, I mean, Tom, is there any other outstanding questions on it? Because, I mean, I don't think we're going to run into any stackability issues. Um, I, well, no, at this point, I think it, the design is coming together pretty good. I, I mean, think it is. Yeah. A little while ago, I uploaded the latest version of it. And uh, one thing I yeah. did want to uh, do is I looked up this guy uh, that, that commented on it, you know, the guy that liked my sketch up. And this uh -huh. is John. Bacchus, and he's the uh, product uh, management director at Trimble Navigation. Mm -hmm. So he's uh, kind of the big shot in there. Oh, yeah. And so so anyway, that's nice to see that somebody you know, is paying attention to this kind of thing. 
Yeah. No, this is that's good. So I, I mean, I really like the simplicity. I think the, <clears throat> you know, I think it's all coming together. I mentioned about the battery being turned the other way. The, the exhaust can go either out or to out to the side or to the bottom. So. Okay, let me share my screen with you while we're doing the. Uh, go ahead. I can I can show you give give you a run through of what I've been doing. Uh, start the screen share. Okay. Mm-hmm. So this is it. Basically, what I've got right now is the the exhaust goes just out and down here at a 45 degree angle. So I think if that was pointing to the outside, you know, or pointing at the tracks, that would probably be okay. Uh huh. Yeah, that'll be fine. And then um, I, I did go and put bolts. To, in a, yeah. Uh, so you can see all the bolts. I did find one conflict over here. Uh, so I had to move these, uh, the output port and the, this little uh, control panel over a little bit. So because this was had a bolt going right through here. Mm hmm. Um, Good. And then I added bolts for the um, the expanded seal to hold this down. Mm -hmm. Now, now these are three eighth inch bolts, and I put yeah. big, big washers on there. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm guessing that that should be sufficiently strong for holding these uh, these little panels down. I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, unless you're like you're ramming into things, like like if you're gonna, I mean, I think so. The the use case where you back up a machine into a tree or into a building. Um, yeah. That, that, that's why I mounted everything on the inside. Like right. Um, what happens in a case like that? So the mesh itself is pretty good for like regular scrub, but if you just go straight into a tree, you're gonna. The first thing that's gonna go is what the bolts or the mesh. Like if you go like straight into a rock and you know. Ram into something with that. You mean the expanded steel? Yeah. Do we want to? If you back up this into uh, something that's that's sticking out, I mean, it, it's pretty well. All the critical components are beneath the the yeah. frame. But if you have something that pokes through and penetrates this oil cooler, then you can have oil run all over the place and you can lose all your pressure. Yeah. Um. Right. I'm thinking uh, probably a good idea was, I mean, I could see like that, that expanded steel is pretty strong. Um, I would use bigger bolts. Can we just use like even three quarter? Um, because imagine a case where you just really put a lot of pressure on that expanded steel. Those bolts are going to pretty much like rip right out if they're three eighths. Um, so this could, I think it could be good. Just use thicker bolts there. It'll, if you have bigger washers too, they'll really grab onto the expanded mesh. And uh, I mean, the mesh itself, I mean, actually, if we wanted to go really, like really make that very strong, even stronger, it would be to put a a bar across the top of the mesh. I mean, that's and then bolt it down with like one inch bolts so that thing is not going anywhere like because each one inch bolt or three quarter inch bolt it's like you got tens of thousands of clamp strength oh i see what you mean okay um, so, so just take a take a strap like we did for the tanks and, and right uh, i mean is that it's doable it's just more parts and more weight i mean should probably maybe leave it at this for now maybe consider that for the future yeah. um but i i would say that the bigger bolts won't hurt that's not not a lot to ask for um okay i mean for a bar that would really hold it it would really have to be like a one inch bar so it wouldn't you know like some something super heavy if you really want it okay but yeah it's it's a little too much for now um yeah yeah other than this i mean it's looking pretty good um very simple yeah uh, i could look see it that you know we're trying to build this i could see like 
you know, I'm kind of thinking, okay, how does this all go together? And, and I'm pretty optimistic that if we have all the parts, I mean, the assembly this is going to go pretty, pretty fast. Everything is quite accessible. Like, unlike the small structural power cube, like even with details like the, the cooler being on top, the lack of access to the engine is not good. Here it's, you know, you snap the engine in and out quickly. Yeah, yeah. we got good access to the pump here. And, mm -hmm. and, and in this version, I uh, flipped the oil uh, filter so it's upside down like this. Because that, that always sucks if your oil filter is the other direction and you, when you unscrew it, then it mm. spills oil all over the place. Um, so the oh, yeah. control panel is on the inside. And, and is this okay that this uses the smaller bolts? Because, uh, I mean, it's going to be in the inside. There's nothing should should be hitting that. You know? No, that's and that should be good. There. And then the other uh, two panels... Because you want to two of them go in through one hole? That's the idea? I mean, they they, crisp, they cross through the same bolt holes, yeah? Yeah, yeah well, that, that's a one-inch hole with three-eighths bolts. I mean, yeah, be yeah, high. that's good. Now the one thing is this. this and maybe just um, just use like half inch bolts, maybe. Okay. You think they would fit? They should fit, or no? I, I, I think. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess they should. They, they should fit, because the hole is one and one sixteenth. tried to get this shelf to be like a two by two angle iron. Yeah. It, it just wasn't working out. And so it's three, uh, it's about three this way and about two over. Yeah. Uh, probably what we want to do for that is um, if we assume we have the torch table, we should do that from six, from eighth inch steel and then just perforate it and bend it. If we have the torch table, that, because you've got the locate the holes, too. Right. That you need to do. Yeah. And actually, the holes for the filter are pretty relatively precise. So. Yeah, it's one and thirteen sixteenths uh, from old hole. Oh, no, uh, in this one, I'm sorry, it's one one and. Yeah, one and torch table would help a bit there to take that to like no fabrication time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Otherwise, you you know, if you're drilling that, that's or torching, that's a, you've so got six of, holes uh, there. What, what have we got going for the torch table? Is there any uh, yeah, there's a good good promise. If you go to, I just posted uh, Facebook. Facebook update on that. Open to right. what is all okay. what is all um, yeah, uh, the torch table is looking really good in a sense that next week, by next Wednesday, they should actually be cutting. And we are planning on, you know, as soon as they test that out, we want to build this towards the middle of June here. So the very simple design that's in the last, uh, let me sh send you this post here on the chat. Um, you should actually take a look at it because it discusses the design points and it's looking good. So that's looking very positive. I mean, that's, you know, one of those amazing things that someone's finally doing it. Now that there's the, I started calling it the CNC torch table effect, but the thing is that they're not, not going to get into, they don't have the time right now to finish the open source controller part. So we're going to use open, not open source controller parts because the controller right now, unless you're using like, well, there's simply no open source controller that's available today to do it without some messing around and there is no open source height controller without doing some development work so the the electronics to date remain proprietary but it's 
I call it the CNC torch torch effect because it's one of those things that because it's challenging enough, nobody ends up going in there and actually just doing it. And then for years, it's not done. I mean, it's exactly the, the controls are at the same stage they were about five years ago in many ways. Um, so anyway, but we can do that uh, since if we want to use their mechanics and do that, we can use their torch table. It's open design by all means on the mechanical. The controller part will need to be open sourced. But it's looking good altogether. Okay, but, but uh, does it look hopeful that we'll have one for the workshop? Yeah. Something? Yeah, and we'll know where we're at, whether we're going to be able to have it here, probably by. I mean, plan is to start building it, to build it here about middle of June so in about two weeks two three weeks I mean they're pretty much getting theirs that's a three weeks from now they're getting theirs up by you know by the next time I talk to them like this Wednesday they should actually I think they might have initial cuts they're doing pretty well yeah uh, I mean surprisingly I mean they can using their I mean it just blew me away they they can a person can stand on their design and a thing can move them with quarter inch drive belts. Can you believe that? I mean these guys are they're pretty good. These guys are pretty good in, in their design ability. So uh, it's looking really positive. Well look at what we did with the first micro power cube. And oh yeah. Quarter inch belt, right? <laughs> oh yeah. And and by the way, um, if you really want to know where I think the power cube, micro power cube comes in, and it's actually something to I wanted to bring up again, I do see it fitting in the broad scale agriculture uh, automated chicken tractors. So here we're planning, we're planning on our alley. Uh, basically next year we're planning on major major plant out. I'm talking like the 30 acres is going to be in trees next year. So about 10,000 plants or so, we're going to go nuts on a plant out. And this year I'm pretty much collecting stock, just getting aware of all the, where I can get all the stock. A lot of it is going to be grown. But in between alleys, imagine you had 30 foot alleyways, 30 to 50 foot alleyways, and they're just plain grass. Perfect place for a, a good sized chicken tractor that would be with a power cube. It can now weigh in the thousands of pounds range. That means you can move. A substantial structure that can be self-watering and the chickens are self-feeding because they they eat plants and bugs so I think that's where the power cube could really become useful that imagine you have one chicken tractor that's got 50 to 100 chickens and you drive it with a solar power cube solar micro power cube that costs you about $200 um, a pop I think that's economically feasible Um, well, what I would see happening is similar, yeah, I mean, just a battery where you're charging a battery and then every so often you're, yeah, either a small DC motor, um, or the similar condition as right now where you have, uh, a horsepower motor and, uh, but you're driving that from a battery. A battery is not that expensive. Well, a, chick uh, a chicken tractor, you only move it, you know, do you move it every day or just like once every... Well, the point is, you uh, depends on the size of the chicken tractor. Uh, the idea here is you move it like all day, so each one of those tractors spans a bunch of area. It's it's really about how many the the balance of how many chickens you can fit in there, and how much you f have to feed supplementally. If you can move it around a lot, the chickens have plenty to 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 live on plenty of bugs and and uh, grass and and all of that so they'll be awesome because that could provide fertility for the plants and insect control at the same time and it could be um, I could see that integrating with the GPS here that all this um, fancy GIS stuff where we're starting to get all this stuff pretty automated and extremely efficient at affordable prices So uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we gotta get the 
we, I mean, we, we should release the power, the micro cube. I, I don't think we've got the, the motor worked out yet, do we? Uh, 